Welcome to Big News with me, Vina, and me, Kathleen. So we have Sunday School today from age 5 to 11. We will learn about guarding the faith. If, if you're preteen or teenagers from grades 6 to 12, we have Big Teens with Mr. Sam Park during the service. And if you are young adults from age 18, we have young adults hang out every two weeks after the service. We will be playing games, eat together, share, and talk about our life. For more information, you can ask Sam Park or Alice. We have Saturday Breakfast Club with Miss Laurel from ages 5 to 12 at 8 a.m. on Zoom. Well, thanks to everybody who does those, and especially Angie for putting those together. That's always fun. I'm always interested to see what they come up with. Such a creative part. And next week, it wasn't on the announcements, but next week, the kids and their parents are hanging out at the Kowalskis, who may or may not be there. We probably won't be there. Are you guys have fun without us? That's why God gave us a big porch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's Family Sunday. And uh, Sayaka is arranging it. So wave Sayaka so they know who. If you want to be part of that, uh, let her know, all right? We have exciting news. Next Friday, we have the Johnsons. Daryl and Gail coming from the U.S. And so you will meet them next Sunday. And they are going to be taking care of you. They are like the best auntie and uncle. I, that, that Waldemar and I can leave, uh, leave you in their hands. And they are fun. They are really outgoing and friendly. So one of the things that Gail does is she has a doctorate in spiritual formation. And she's going to be doing a series. All right, She's going to be doing a series on... Uh, spiritual formation and you won't want to miss that we'll have the dates coming next week but I think she's either going to do three or four Sundays right after the gathering 
So if you've ever wondered about the spiritual disciplines, you know, how can we pray? Why are there so many reading scripture? What does it mean to fast? What does it mean to immerse yourself in silence and solitude? I think that's what she's going to be talking about. But anyway, she's a, a, a beloved speaker. And uh, if, if there is such a thing as an expert, it's Gail, all right? So, and Gail's a man's man, loves fishing, loves being outdoors. So, uh, don't take the fishing holes here and introduce them to that. But, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you're going to enjoy the time with them. And then, uh, you know, we just want you to make each other feel welcome. And to, to start that off, just before the kids go to their uh, teen area, the youth area, and the children leave, we're going to have Roy and Laura come up and read a chapter of James for us today, all right? So, you guys, welcome, and thank you for doing that. Check, check. I'll be reading from uh, the book of James, chapter 1. My brothers and sisters, you will face all kinds of trouble. When you do, think of it as pure joy. Your faith will be tested. You know that when this happens, it will produce in you the strength to continue. And you must allow this strength to finish its work. Then you will be all you should be. You will have everything you need. If any of you needs wisdom, you should ask God for it. He will give it to you. God gives freely to everyone and doesn't find fault. But when you ask, you must believe. You must not doubt. That's because a person who doubts is like a wave of the sea. The wind blows and tosses them around. They shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. This kind of person can't make up their mind. They can never decide what to do. Here's what believers who are in low positions in life should be proud of. They should be proud that God has given them a high position in the kingdom. But rich people should take pride in their low positions. That's because they will fade away like wildflowers. The sun rises. Its burning heat dries up the plants. Their blossoms fall. Their beauty is destroyed. In the same way, rich people will fade away. They fade away even as they go about their business. Blessed is the person who keeps on going when times are hard. After they have come through hard times, this person will receive a crown. The crown is life itself. The Lord has promised it to those who love Him. When a person is tempted, they shouldn't say, God is tempting me. God can't be tempted by evil, and He doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted by their own evil desires. These desires lead them on and drag them away. When these desires are allowed to remain, they lead to sin. And when sin is allowed to remain and grow, it leads to death. My dear brothers and sisters, don't let anyone fool you. Every good and perfect gift is from God. This kind of gift comes down from the Father who created the heavenly lights. These lights create shadows that move, but the Father does not change like these shadows. God chose to give us new birth through the message of truth. He wanted us to be the first harvest of his new creation. My dear brothers and sisters, pay attention to what I say. Everyone should be quick to listen, but they should be slow to speak. They should be slow to get angry. Human anger doesn't produce the holy life God wants. So get rid of everything that is sinful. Get rid of the evil that is all around us. Don't be too proud to accept the word that is planted in you. It can save you. Don't just listen to the word. You fool yourselves if you do that. You must do what it says. Suppose someone listens to the word, but doesn't do what it says. Then they are like a person who looks at their face in a mirror. After looking at themselves, they leave. And right away they forget what they look like. But suppose someone takes a good look at the perfect law that gives freedom. 
and they keep looking at it. Suppose they don't forget what they've heard, but they do what the law says. Then this person will be blessed in what they do. Suppose people think that their beliefs and how they live are both right, but they don't control what they say. Then they are fooling themselves. Their beliefs and way of life are not worth anything at all. Here are the beliefs and way of life that God our Father accepts as pure and without fault. When widows are in trouble, take care of them. Do the same for children who have no parents, and don't let the world make you impure. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. It's like, wow. 
All right, so today we're just going to do an overview. I'll give you a little bit of the background of the first chapter, then we'll go to chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. It's such a fantastic and rich book. We're going to pull one thing out of each chapter, and then you're going to give us your takeaways. All right, because we're live streaming, we're going to do communion first, and then we're going to do takeaways. So if you want to take some notes and just think, what does this mean to me as a follower of Jesus today? It's so down to earth, so hands on, um, so applicable to real life. I actually considered just reading the book of James to you this morning. I'm like, what could I say that's more direct than this? Well, I really encourage you to read it, all right? I think I'm going to drag this over here. So it's going to be closer to the stream. Okay, so James lists a lot of how to's and how not to live as a follower of Jesus. If you've ever wondered, how do I know God's will? How do I pray or what should I pray for? Or like, what if there are rich people and poor people? How do I deal with that? What if I'm poor and my brothers and sisters in faith are rich? Or what if I'm rich and there are a lot of poor people? What do we do? James is very practical. Okay, and I encourage you to read it. It's short. It's five chapters. It'll take you, I don't know, if you're a slow reader, it'll take you half an hour. All right? So every Sunday we say our ABCs to remind you how you're invited into God's family. Okay, let's go. A, admit that you can't save yourself. That God who made us had a plan. It says from before the foundation of the world, he had a plan to bring you close, to bring me close, all right? We admit even though we don't know all the details. And Waldemar is a theologian. You can ask him some stuff and he'll know a lot of stuff, but in general, he'll be like, hey, you know what, let's leave that to what? We don't understand. Okay, so there's some things we don't understand, but we admit that God has a solution. B, we believe that God's salvation is for us. It's not for perfect people. Otherwise, like my friend said to me, you're not perfect. I said, what makes you think I'm perfect? I said, why would Jesus die for me if I was perfect? I said, get to know me. You'll know why Jesus died for me. <laughs> right? So we believe that God is big enough to cover all our sins. The sacrifice of Jesus is enough for those who believe in him. All right, see. Commit. Commit. We commit to living to him, to being part of his family. And then what? Is it like you go in a club and you get locked in and you never come out again? How do you actually live? Well, today let's read this from James. My brothers and sisters, you will face all kinds of trouble when you do think of it as pure joy. I bet your mom never said that to you. <laughs> anyway, your faith will be tested. You know that when this happens, it will produce in you the strength to continue. And you must allow this strength to finish its work. Then you will be all that you should be. You will have everything you need. Wow. What a way to say hello to people you haven't met. This is verse 2 of James. All right? James greets the believers across the known world by saying, Hey, you're suffering because you're followers of Jesus. That should bring you joy. Well, when we lived in Seattle, and, and this was the fun of coming to Bando, all those house plants that I nursed so tenderly through the winters in our Seattle house, that could hardly make it through the winter, we're just chopping them down every week because they grow so fast, right? They're growing fast because they're in the rain, they're in the hot sun, they're in the wind, so their stems were really strong. In Seattle, it's cloudy much of the time, so we put lights on our plants, and we watered them. They grew really fast and tall, but they were skinny and kind of weak. When I take them out in the, in the spring, I would have to put them on the porch. I'd have to put them in the shade. Why? Because the sun would burn them at first. And, you know, the stems were weak. If, if the wind came, they'd snap off, right? Why do they grow so well here? Hot sun, hard rain, hot high wind. 
right? That makes them strong. Okay, here's another thing I want you to think about. If, if you're a parent and you have children, what about if you always dress them, tie their shoes, and feed them? They're never allowed to do that for themselves. They never learn that, right? What if they're never allowed to get near the street and learn how traffic works, right? What about if they're never allowed to play with kids because you're afraid they're going to catch a cold? When they are a mantra, when they are teenagers, they're going to get out the front door, I promise you. All right? And they're going to get run over by cars. They're going to get sick with everything. They're going to, people are going to be going like, who dressed you? My mother. Or my mother, better not. Okay, there are skills that we need that we only get by trying. And think about this, would, would your parent be a good parent if they did everything for you, if they sheltered you, if they just kept you in a little bubble? No. And God, your Heavenly Father, is not going to keep you in a magic circle of health. He's not going to keep you in a, just like a bubble of blessing all the time. You wouldn't grow strong. James says you're going to suffer. And to suffer is human. I mean... Everybody gets sick just because your neighbor coughs on you, right? Mm -hmm. All right? So everybody's going to die at some point. We have a front and we have a back to our life. All right? That's not God being mean to you when, when you die or somebody in your family dies. It's because we're human. All right? We've had people say to us, oh, the Christian life is so hard. We're thinking we should just do something else. Because it's so hard, and we're just like, it's hard for everyone. Look around. But who has Jesus with them? Through what it means to be human. So is it a kindness to keep something absolutely safe? No. All right? So James says suffering will make you stronger. If somebody told you, that following Jesus is an easy path. You're not going to like what James says to believers of his time and says to us. He takes for granted that there are going to be hard times, times when you have to push through, times when you have to pray for God's help, times when you depend on other people, and especially believers, to comfort you, to provide you with resources you need, to mentor you. Listen to this from James 1.12. And Roy read this. Blessed is the person who keeps on going when times are hard. After they've come through hard times, that person will receive a crown. The crown is life itself. The Lord has promised it to those who love him. So our reward for being faithful is life here on earth in the company of God, and his family, and eternity with God in heaven. And next week we're going to talk about Peter, who is another disciple of Jesus. And Peter agrees with James. Listen to what he says in the first chapter of 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It is a privilege to come into that invitation of ABC. It's not like, well, I have a formula. No, you come into this living relationship and God says, I have an inheritance for you. It's just a thrill. Okay, so he says that and it's like, yay, all is well. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though for now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. That's maybe less exciting news, right? These come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So your suffering, your steadfastness, brings glory to God. Those who are watching you, who mock you, who make life hard for you, they want to see the life of Jesus flowing out through you, toward them. As Jesus changes your heart, you can be kind, forgiving, loving to your neighbors. You would care for them and comfort them, even if they're mean to you. 
That's what Jesus did. Think about this. He died for them as well as for you and me. So we are imperfect and we have earned his judgment. But instead he forgives us. He watches over us. He helps, encourages, gives us what we need. I want to ask you today, are you that kind of a believer? Remember, we're being transformed to be more and more like Jesus. Are you that kind of a believer? Does the living water of Jesus flow out through you into the people around you? Just think about that. What did you do this last week that was life-giving because you belong to Jesus? Well, Lord pointed out to me that some people think that James and Paul conflict. All right? Paul says, deeds without faith in Jesus are useless. So your good works by themselves are... In fact, he writes to the Corinthian believers, doing good without God's love behind it is about as useful as banging on a gong or playing a cymbal. Not really helpful. All right? But really noisy. And we all know followers of Jesus who are just really noisy about being any good at all. All right? Sorry. Right? I have been that person sometimes, and so have you. So be careful. Let the love of God be part of your faith. So Paul says, deeds without faith are useless. And James flips it. He says, faith without living out your faith is useless. That's not conflict. That's the whole picture. All right? James says your actions will show if you're actually following Jesus. You're being transformed from the inside out. Your heart is changed, so your whole life, day by day, is becoming new. And that changed heart is where your care for people come from. That's where your good works come from, not from your self-improvement program, 30 days of being kind to whoever. Whatever, okay? Or do you need to be a good person so that God notices you? You know, God already sees you. There's nothing you can do to make him see you more. He isn't suddenly surprised, like, oh, Rosemary's down there. Hmm. But she, you know, she just did what? No. He knows my name. He knows your name. He already sent Jesus to die for you. So good works will flow from a heart that is changed, from a heart that is accepted and embraced the love of God. If a heart that says thank you to God for his goodness will also bring good actions towards other people. So if you want to be a good person, let God change your heart and you will be better and better, more like Jesus every day. So many human systems and religions, in fact, some of my atheist friends are on this as well, they emphasize being a good person and doing good deeds. Do we as, as believers and followers of Jesus have anything against that? Good deeds, being a good person? No. Of course not. In fact, James says in uh, chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, right? If you can't tell somebody's following Jesus, we used to laugh when we grew up in a very, very conservative, conservative, conservative church. All right? No earrings. I've fallen from grace. All right? No, definitely no necklace or anything that was worldly, right? I mean, we didn't even speak the same language as the people around us. It was good for us, because we, we can still quote you entire blocks of scripture in German. All right? And sometimes when we're praying, that language of the heart is still German, because that's how we were church, right? But we look. All right? But we were not encouraged to interact with the people around us. We were like a fortress. And in fact, the verse across the front of the hall said be faithful unto death God will give you the crown of life Revelations 2 verse 11 verse 10 or 11, I can't remember I saw that thing so many times we were preparing to die, we were preparing to live and here's what James says, what good is it 
If someone says you have faith and you have no deeds, can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, you say, I believe in God, oh, praise God. If it's not accompanied by actions, you're dead. Your faith is good for nothing. He's pretty blunt. So at big, he gives some weapon. If you or someone you know needs our support, please tell us. We have funds for that. And we partner with those telling good news in other places. Read the new, the updated mission letters. We pay our rent so that this conference, this conference center can keep going. We hire employees so they can feed their families. Some of you have businesses and your wages keep other people alive. Some of you are employees, and I want to tell you, if you're working for somebody, do your best work. Pray for the company. Pray for your boss. It's part of the living water that flows out of you. This is a result of a heart turned toward God, not just being a good person. It means you're being transformed from the heart outward. Okay, that's chapter two. Chapter three, James tells us to be careful with our words. And he has two comparisons for what the tongue is, spark that sets a whole forest on uh, a blaze, right? And he says, it's like a rudder on a ship. Have any of you ever been on a big ship and seen that rudder? The bigger the ship, the bigger the rudder. But I remember my grandpa trying to steer us across the Fraser River in his aluminum boat. There was a rudder on the, on the back, on the propeller, that determined which way we went. And that is what your tongue is like. A big boat steered by a small thing. So in the same way, what you say steers your lives. Be careful, James says, what you say to each other, but also be careful what you tell yourself about the world and about what God has you. James says if we're wise, we'll be peacemakers. We won't envy or be jealous of others. We'll wish them well and do what we can to help them, not pull them down. Listen to this. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, and that doesn't just mean that a wife listens to her husband. I'm speaking to everybody here. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. My mother was born a peacemaker. Sadly, she has a daughter who's a troublemaker. Right? So I have had to learn the process of peace. I am always stirring, right? And my mom, and my dad's like that. My mom's like oil on the water. It's making things smooth. I tell you, I don't know if she has anybody who has anything against her. The people that she walks with, the people in her community look to her and love her because she's a peacemaker. And I have said, you know, I'm like my dad, but that is one way in which I wish I was like my mom. And which I strive to be more like Jesus, a person of peace. Because you have a harvest of righteousness that comes from that. Okay, look at this list. Are you pure? Are you on the way to becoming pure? Maybe that's a better way to say it. Are you on the way to becoming peace-loving? When you sat next to somebody at work, were you considerate? When somebody told you, I want you to take this to there, were you submissive? Or did you go like, I'm more important than that? Were you full of mercy when somebody needed mercy? And is there good fruit coming? Are we impartial if somebody, James actually talks a lot about this. If somebody rich and somebody poor comes in, do you run over to the rich person and go like, 
Oh, hi, my name is so-and-so. What can you do for me? Maybe not that bluntly. All right, when somebody poor asks you for something, you go like, oh, not again. They're always asking. Right? Are you impartial? Are you like the life that God has in me? I let flow out in every direction. Are you sincere? Or are you faking it? Are you hoping nobody knows you? In that conservative congregation, we knew a lot of things about each other, but when we came on Sunday, we dressed up. Sometimes a preacher had been somewhere and he told us all what he saw. Do not! And we went like, oh, he must have visited so-and-so. Right? Because under that veneer was the real person. You're a real person. You don't have to be perfect. If you want Walter and me to be perfect, go somewhere else, sorry. All right? We're just as broken as everybody, but we're in this process of having our hearts transformed and being renewed. And that's what we want for you. That's what James wants for you. If you haven't memorized the verse, and you're going like, where do I go from here? After I've accepted Christ, after I believe, after I commit, take this list, memorize it, and say, God, make this come alive in me as I follow. It's a great list. All right, so how do you live as a follower of Christ? Be a person who does good things from the heart. Not to be seen or please God, because he already loves you. And be a person of peace. So in chapter 4, James warns us against quarreling and insisting on our rights and against trying to be better or more important than others. He says we should resist the devil and come close to God, who is the one who lifts us up and gives us life. All right? Chapter 4 is a powerful chapter. In the final chapter, chapter 5, James says be fair. Pray, pay proper wages, care for the poor, don't take advantage of other people. He says we must submit to God, not to question God and push back in anger. You didn't do this for me, so I'm running, you know, like having a tantrum. Part of being a vigorous person is when you're little, you throw yourself around. And if you've seen the kids who throw themselves down and scream, sorry, that was me, all the time. My office teased me. I cried and screamed, slammed the door. I was the high passion person. All right? As you mature, if I throw myself down here because the hot water was ready or something like that, wouldn't you think that was ridiculous? It was ridiculous as a two and three year old. It was even worse as a four and five year old. But I finally grew out of that. Okay, so if you're throwing tantrums, Stop it. Grow up. If you're fighting, if you're jealous, if you're not a peacemaker, grow up. Jesus gives you this invitation. You don't have to stay where you are. If you're impure, if you're struggling with pornography and impure thoughts and just keeping your life on track, grow up. Let Jesus transform you. All of us, Paul says, so that's what we all were. So let's grow up together as a church family. And Waldemar and I are cheering for you. As we grow up, we cheer for our brothers and sisters who are growing up as well. All right? We submit to God. So do you have faith? If you do, you will act as though God is in control, James says, as though he cares for you. You'll pray and you'll ask others to pray for you when you're in trouble or when you're sick. And James closes with this. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, that someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So the last thing he says is let's look out for each other. When you see somebody wandering off, you know, bring them back. Be loving, but bring them back. Waldemar and I, the ministry team, call you, and we check up on you when you're gone for a while. But we don't always see. We don't always know what's going on with you. We are perfect in noticing. So you have to care for each other as well. Call people. Go visit. Bring them food. 
You cook something extra. Don't just put it in the freezer. Or just make your family eat it and eat it, eat it until it's gone. Give something away. Hire people if you're looking for an employee. Pass them a good opportunity if you hear about it. All right? So the book of James is full of practical ideas to live and to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to ask you right after communion to respond in a practical way. We're going to ask you for your takeaways. What did you hear? And I'm not looking for a wildly spiritual answer or deep theology. You don't have to give a college lecture. Because today is very down to earth. It's real life, and we just skim the surface. I just can't wait to preach through this book in the evening. So what are we going to do as God's people? First of all, we're going to stand up. Are there any of you who don't have communion? Put your hands up. If you need communion, Walmart's going to help you with this. And then we'll do takeaways. Cloud will run around right after um, with, with that. So if you don't have communion, just raise your hand up. And if you're at home, if you're part of our live stream, just go get something to eat, something to drink, and join us in the celebration of who Jesus is. So this is something we are, oops, I haven't turned on my mic. There we go. Okay. That should be on? Yes. Yep, it's got the little blue lights. There we are. So this is something we do together. It's, it's a celebration of what Christ has done for us, and it's a marker that we do as a community. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, you are welcome to join us. Um, if you just decided today, this is what I want to do, you're welcome to join us. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So please take your bread and eat together with us his body broken for us. Would you stand with me as we celebrate the blood of Jesus, God's solution? In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. So please take your cup and drink with us. His blood shed for us. 